starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome. Uh, this is Valerie Woodbury. I am the certification chair of the Tennessee chapter of HFMA, and we are glad you've joined us today for our um, update on Medicare's two midnight rule webinar. Um, we have posted the slides on our website, and you can find that link in your um, chat box um, on your webinar. And we do have a few announcements before we get started. Um, there is registration uh, open for our next webinar, which is Protecting Your Medicare and Medicaid Billing Privileges on September 9th. And you can visit our um, Tennessee HFMA uh, website webinars for more information there. Um, if you are interested in becoming a certified healthcare financial professional, we have um, a five-week webinar series starting in September to help you prepare for that. So again, you can visit our website for more information on that. And we have registration for this year's Fall Institute. Um, it will be open in just a few weeks, so block off your calendar October 22nd through 24th um, and plan to visit Gatlinburg. We have more information um, at a different website, um, thefallinstitute.org. Um, just a few requirements. Um, for those of you who need to obtain CPE um, certificates, uh, you must be connected to the webinar for at least 90% of the duration of the webinar, and you must respond to at least two-thirds of the polling questions today. Um, so today our speaker is uh, Mark Polston. He is a partner in the healthcare practice at King & Spalding. Mr. Polston has over 20 years of experience in federal litigation, most of which um, has focused on Medicare, Medicaid, and Affordable Care Act regulatory policies, as well as healthcare fraud litigation, enforcement, and investigations. Prior to King & Spalding, Mr. Polston served as the Deputy Associate General Counsel for Litigation in the Office of the General Counsel CMS Division at the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, where he advised senior HHS officials on CMS litigation. So uh, Mark is very well qualified to share uh, with us today, so welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thank you very much, Valerie, and thank you for everybody who is joining us this morning. Um, of course, um, the topic of today's uh, webinar is Medicare's Two Midnight Rule, and I'm going to try to give you an update as to what's happening uh, with the two midnight rule. Um, I think it's fair to say that the two midnight rule was perhaps the biggest regulatory change that CMS has made to the Medicare program in the last few years. Um, it came uh, a little, as a little bit of a surprise when it was uh, promulgated and announced in 2014, uh, for the fiscal year 2014 uh, year. Uh, it was confusing and it continues to confuse uh, practitioners as to actually how to comply with the various requirements of the two midnight rule. And there's also confusion about the continued um, uh, the continued longevity, I would say, of the two midnight rule. There have been uh, a lot of regulatory uh, challenges. There's been legal challenges to the two midnight rule. There's been two uh, legal challenges to the rate cut that uh, came in attendance with the two midnight rule. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later on this morning as well. Um, but there have been, there's been a lot of uh, attention uh, placed on this by CMS, uh, placed on uh, the two midnight rule by Congress. And so there are questions as to whether or not uh, we'll be, uh, the two midnight rule will be with us uh, for much longer, and if so, how much longer. And I'm going to try to touch on some of those issues today. But mostly, I also want to give uh, a basic tutelage in, in what the two midnight rule is uh, and uh, what uh, hospitals and hospital organizations are doing to try to comply with the two midnight rule and what the real um, uh, regulatory uh, challenges are. As you can see, just by demonstration of the second slide here, uh, this is a confusing area. There's a lot going on. And if anybody tells you the two midnight rule is something of a past, uh, they're not telling you the truth because the two midnight rule is still something very relevant and everybody should be well informed about it. I always like to start off these presentations by sort of explaining how did we get to the two midnight rule and what was going on. I think it's sometimes helpful to understand what CMS was hoping to achieve with the two midnight rule. And I think we can really kind of trace the roots of what this all the way back to um, the recovery audit contractor program and its initiation. Um, as this slide demonstrates, um, beginning at about 2010, 2011, 
uh, the Recovery Auditor Program, which became a nationwide program in 2010, um, the recovery audit contractors began to focus their uh, auditing activity on uh, inpatient stays, and specifically inpatient stays of short duration, or what people call short stays. And in those cases, uh, they often audited these claims uh, and came to the conclusion that these claim that these stays were not medically necessary. In other words, uh, the services might have been necessary, uh, but they should have been provided in what the auditors like to call a lesser intensive setting. In other words, they should have been provided on an outpatient basis. So they would reject um, and deny the medic as medically unnecessary the Part A inpatient stay. These admissions began to represent an enormous a part of the RAC uh, workload uh, in, the, in subsequent years. The RAC denial of short stays as medically unnecessary in turn brought a lot of focus on three components. One, exactly what are the admission standards or what are the admission criteria uh, under the Medicare uh, program? In other words, if the RACs are going to take the position that these stays are medically unnecessary and the patient should not have been admitted, well, what are the standards that CMS uh, proposes for uh, coverage of Part A stays? It also brought focus on uh, CMS's billing policies uh, for billing Part B, uh, that is stuff that would be covered under outpatient services or physician services, uh, for the services that were rendered after the Part A stay was denied. Again, the RACs weren't contending that these services were medically unnecessary. They were just saying they should have been uh, provided in a lesser intensive setting. Um, and as a result of increased audit focus and recovery audit contractors and other auditors saying that hospitals were getting these decisions wrong, well, hospitals reacted and began to uh, keep beneficiaries in observation uh, status. Uh, for longer periods of time than they had been in the past. And so there's an increased frequency in the duration of observation stays that was occurring during the time period of sometime between 2008 uh, and 2011. Um, all of these factors um, were things that CMS began to have to develop a policy around and react to. Uh, there was a class action lawsuit, for example, brought by um, beneficiaries, which has since been dismissed, um, in which they challenged CMS's observation policy. In other words, they looked at what was happening on the observation, uh, the increasing number of cases that were being um, referred to observation as well as increasing length of time uh, that beneficiaries were spending in observation. And from the beneficiary's perspective, observation has a financial impact upon them because often their co-payments under Part B are, are higher than what their co-payments, or excuse me, than what the deductible would be for a Part A stay. But in addition to that, it often um, meant that they were not staying in a hospital for three consecutive days, which is a basic requirement for any sort of long-term uh, skilled nursing facility coverage uh, that they might have once they are transferred to a lesser intensive skilled nursing care facility. Um, so CMS was faced with that lawsuit. The American Hospital Association also um, brought a lawsuit challenging CMS's billing policies on the Part A to Part B uh, issue that I discussed previously. As a result, CMS began to solicit uh, ideas uh, from the public as to exactly uh, what, uh, you know, what should they do about uh, the coverage policy regarding inpatient stays. They recognized that there was a need to make these uh, claims, excuse me, to make these uh, uh, standards for uh, the medical necessity of inpatient stays more clear. Um, and so they sought um, comments uh, in 2013 uh, outpatient uh, rule. Uh, in addition to that, CMS began to change its policies on the Part A to Part B rule. And then in fiscal year 2014, CMS uh, took the comments from the 2013 outpatient rule and they formulated that into a proposed policy called the Two Midnight Rule or the Two Midnight Admission Standard. So. As you can see, the, whole, the entire pathway really begins with uh, the excessive focus uh, on uh, the inpatient stays that, um, that the RAC uh, auditors or the RAC program has brought us. That's really what has fueled the two midnight admission standards. So it's natural for everyone to ask the question, uh, which is this, um, how has um, the two midnight standard uh, clarified uh, exactly uh, when CMS will or will not cover 
um, inpatient stays. In other words, has the two midnight standard uh, done what CMS anticipated that would be? Did it bring that clarity? And I'm going to make the case that it has not brought clarity and what it has brought instead has been confusion. Um, there's one final point in this story that I think I should touch before we start getting into the inpatient rules themselves, and, and that's that um, what is going on today is as the uh, recovery audit contractor increased their work, work, workloads, focusing on short inpatient stays, um, hospitals uh, who have been the, the basic recipient of many of these uh, audits have essentially distrusted that the recovery auditors are getting those uh, uh, getting the review criteria correct, in other words, are applying the right standard as to when a stay is medically necessary, and they begin to audit, uh, excuse me, they begin to appeal these claims through the Medicare uh, appeal system, uh, ultimately um, seeking to have a uh, hearing in front of a Medicare uh, administrative law judge or ALJ. Um, the volume of those cases has become so great that has formed a bit of a crisis. Today, um, the Office of Medicare Hearings and Appeals has announced that as of April 2013, uh, the backlog on hospital inpatient stay audits uh, and denials of inpatient stays has grown so significantly uh, that they no longer can assign them to administrative law judges for the foreseeable future. That's something we're gonna talk about a little bit uh, at the end of the program today because um, the Office of Medicare Hearings and Appeals has announced a few pilot programs to try to um, reduce this backlog, and I'm going to explain those to the audience as well. Now let's talk about the new inpatient rules and what they are. But before, um, I'm always interested in knowing before I get into this, um, what the experience has been with um, the audience in terms of uh, how, if they work at a hospital or if they have hospital clients, what the experience has been um, with implementation of the two midnight rule thus far. So Valerie, could you please um, ask the uh, audience our first polling question? Certainly. So our first question today is, which response most closely characterizes your hospital or client's experience with implementing the two midnight rule? Uh, one, it has presented significant difficulties. They aren't I'm sorry, I'm not sure what the rest of that one is. Implementation was challenging. We were able to work it out. Implementation was straightforward and easy, or not sure, or uh, for some, it may not apply to you. Well, uh, obviously, this is not a scientific poll by any stretch of the means, but you know the the results that I see here about more than a third or around a third of the audience um, they've had significant difficulties and they're still trying to work this out while um, th there's a significant percentage of of individuals who found the implementation to be challenging but you know they feel it's as if they've gotten it uh, worked out and, and that is not um, that is not uncharacteristic of my experience with my clients as well on this on this issue. Um, many hospitals are still finding them, these rules to be difficult to implement, while others um, have, you know, have been, been able to uh, respond to some of the challenges. And uh, sometimes they find that when they thought they had it all actually all ironed out, other issues uh, begin to pop up. So let's just kind of talk a little bit about what the new rules are. And I'm going to cover some ground somewhat quickly in the next slide um, as to what the actual standards are. Um, for the two midnight rule, and then there's two attending policies. There's a policy requiring, um, as a condition of Medicare payment, a written inpatient stay, excuse me, a written uh, inpatient order, uh, as well as physician certification. That's a new update. The certification uh, requirement, as I'm going to explain in a minute, has been proposed to be eliminated by CMS, which would be a, a fairly significant alteration to the current rule. Let's just talk about the, the basic standard itself. Um, before um, uh, before the two midnight rule, uh, CMS's standard or its coverage standard for when a stay was appropriate uh, was not in the regulation, but was in CMS uh, policy manuals. And this slide basically describes exactly what the standard was. Uh, basically, uh, it was a decision that was um, given to a physician. Uh, it was uh, delegated to the physician to admit 
Uh, it's complex medical judgment can only be made by a physician according to the uh, according to the uh, coverage standards. Uh, but the physician had to look at sort of a gestalt uh, grouping of factors. They had to look at the patient's medical needs, their severity of signs and symptoms, things like the likelihood of adverse events, uh, should the patient be discharged. And they had to make a decision on a 24-hour benchmark as to whether or not looking at all those factors, uh, it was better for the patient to be in the hospital or not. And if, and if so, uh, they should admit the patient uh, to the hospital. And so that was pretty much it. And you could see why there was a lack of clarity because this was not at all getting to the discrete level of you know, what one must do uh, when a patient presents with certain um, symptoms, what one must do if the patient has a certain diagnosis. So CMS's coverage standards were not at the DRG or the diagnosis uh, level uh, whatsoever. Um, the two midnight rule essentially uh, is expressed by CMS as um, a rule which says that inpatient admission and Part A payment is generally inappropriate if a physician does not expect a patient to require a stay that will cross two midnights, um, except when we're talking about inpatient-only procedures, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, in order to make a determination as to whether or not a patient needs, uh, it will be expected to require uh, services that will uh, require a stay that will cross two midnights, a physician at that time should look at factors such as the patient's history and comorbidities, the severity of the signs and symptoms with which they're presenting, and the current medical needs of the patient and the risk of adverse events. Um, this standard, uh, which is now in a regulatory form, has been applied to all hospitals uh, except for um, inpatient rehab facilities. Um, so it applies in the cost setting um, and applies in the, in the LTAC setting as well. Um, in determining whether or not the two midnight ex, uh, expectation, um, excuse me, in determining whether or not the two midnight rule, um, or excuse me, the two midnight benchmark applies, uh, the, the CMS's regulation says that uh, the factors that lead a physician to think that uh, the patient is going to need a two, mid, two midnight stay or a stay that crosses two midnight, it has to be documented in the medical record. Now, CMS recognizes in the rule that there can be some circumstances in which um, even though a physician expected the patient to um, require uh, hospital services for two, uh, two midnights, that that patient, you know, that expectation may eventually be defeated. And so, for example, the unfortunate case of a death um, or if the patient's been transferred or the patient leaves against medical advice or if they just simply improve, um, then they may not actually stay in a hospital for two days. Um, but uh, CMS recognizes that those are exceptions. Uh, and so long as at the time the physician has made the determination um, to admit the patient that there really is evidence in the medical record that it was reasonable for the physician to expect the patient to need hospital services for two days, uh, despite you know radical or clinical improvement after being admitted, then this then the coverage, then then part A coverage would still apply according to CMS. Uh, there are a few exceptions to that benchmark. So one way to think of the benchmark is by CMS essentially saying uh, Medicare will not pay for a Part A stay unless a physician has made a determination that um, the patient is going to require hospital services for a length of period that, that uh, crosses two midnights. There are a few exceptions to that coverage standard. One is if there is a procedure that's on the inpatient only list, then CMS will, um, of course, recognize um, that those claims are payable under Part A, even if the patient doesn't stay uh, two midnights uh, uh, in conjunction with the, those procedures. Uh, those procedures are set out in regulation at 419.22, um, and essentially there are a, a, a big exception to the two midnight rule. CMS also recognizes both in guidance as well as in, um, uh, in, the, in the preamble to the 2014 rule, that there could be rare and unusual circumstances in which um, an individual presents at a hospital, the physician uh, does, cannot reach a conclusion that the patient may need uh, inpatient services for more than two days. But um, nonetheless, uh, that individual uh, may require a level of services that are, that are found only in an inpatient stay. Um, CMS describes those as, uh, this CMS doesn't tell us, except in one circumstance, 
uh, what those rare and unusual circumstances are. Um, in guidance that was uh, promulgated over this past year, CMS did identify one situation um, in which uh, they do consider uh, it to be a rare and unusual case when an individual uh, is uh, admitted for present vision for mechanical ventilation, um, that that is a circumstance in which uh, e even if the physician does not, uh, cannot say or cannot meet that two midnight benchmark, with his or her conclusion that there will be a requirement for hospital services that will last more than 48 hours, that it would still be appropriate to admit and also bill Part A for that patient. Uh, CMS has said that there that what is not to fit within this rare and unusual circumstance uh, are admissions for what to allow the patient to um, uh, to receive telemetry are admissions to an intensive care unit. So, in other words, if somebody's admitted to an intensive care unit and they're discharged within less than 48 hours. CMS does not consider that to be a rare and unusual circumstance um, that would permit payment for Part A, despite the fact that there was not an expectation that the patient uh, should could have stayed for should have stayed for more than 48 hours. Um, and you can see as I'm kind of going through and describing the rule uh, and describing the various sets of circumstances that are uh, exceptions to this, that the, what seems to be a fairly clear rule in sort of conception. That is, you know, you look to determine whether or not a patient is going to be in uh, in the hospital for more than 48 hours. If so, then they're then it's a Part A claim that's payable. Um, that that exception, um, excuse me, that 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 you know superficial clarity becomes a lot less clear as you dig into how the um, rule is actually going to be applied and what the exceptions to the rule are. Um, so this is where I like to uh, kind of step back and, and give a practical piece of uh, advice and guidance, um, though I will be quick to say that um, this is, should not be considered as legal advice um, since there's no attorney-client relationship uh, in the webinar. But a lot of times um, I get questions about, well, you know, if we think that there's something that, you know, we have an inpatient stay that fits this rare and unusual exception, it's not one that CMS you know, identified it's not the mechanical ventilation exception, but yet we think that it applies, can we bill for the claim? Uh, and I think that generally it would be appropriate to do so because CMS acknowledges that the exception exists. Um, one should expect um, that the claim will be denied because it will likely be for, you know, a stay that's less than 48 hours. Uh, the contractor on medical review would look at that claim and would likely deny it, uh, you know, just as a, you know, it would not, uh, it would deny it because it was less than 48 hours, but you would, uh, you know, have the potential to preserve your right to appeal on that, uh, to take it to an administrative law judge and to say, you know, we believe that this fits within the rare and unusual circumstances and here's our case for doing that. Um, you know, the other pathway here is to ask CMS in advance whether uh, you have a certain set of circumstances that you see regularly in a hospital. Um, CMS has said that they're willing to take you know, and enter a dialogue and have discussions about whether or not something fits within um, the rare and unusual exception. So there are just a few um, other um, sorts of portions of the policy or, or aspects of the Tubinet rule that are important to understand. Um, the first is, um, you know, Basically, for purposes of, um, well, I think I could take a step backwards and explain this from a medical review perspective because that's what really matters. The question on medical review uh, is whether or not um, a claim is going to be pay, appropriately paid under Part A or Part or, or not. Um, and when I say claim, I'm referring to an inpatient stay. One should think of the two midnight rule as both a, a, a presumption for medical review as well as a benchmark for medical review. Uh, and then under the presumption, CMS has said that if a claim um, is submitted uh, for payment and that claim uh, is for a stay that lasts more than 48 hours or across two midnights, I should say more specifically, across two midnights longer than after the point in time when the patient was formally admitted, medical contractors, the medical review contractors, including RACs, will be um, instructed to re uh, review that claim and presume that it's medically necessary under Part A. Um, so that's called the two midnight presumption. 
Now, that means that all claims that are submitted for payment that are less than two midnights are presumed not to be medically necessary, but that doesn't mean that they're not ultimately payable, and that's because of the two midnight benchmark. Under the two midnight benchmark, CMS says essentially that you are entitled to count all the time that the patient spends in the hospital, even prior to the point of admission towards the two midnight stay. So for example, if a patient um, uh, comes into the emergency department and there's a determination made that the patient should be placed in observation, which is an outpatient service under Medicare, that patient's placed in observation and they spend one, you know, one midnight in observation. And then uh, there's a decision to admit the patient and they spend the second midnight in observation well, the entire time that they've been in the hospital is now crossed two midnights. Um, under the two midnight benchmark, CMS says that that claim is payable so long as at when at the point in time at which the admission decision was made, um, which was after that first midnight, there was an expectation that the patient would need a total of 48 uh, hospital, excuse me, a total of 48 hours or, or across two midnights in, in the hospital setting. So in other words, under the benchmark, you can count the time prior to all the services that are prior to uh, the formal inpatient order. And if they total over two midnights, then that claim is appropriately payable so long as the benchmark has been met. So there are a number of rules that CMS had to refine uh, and, and provide guidance on. And, and one of them is, well, when do you actually start uh, that clock time? Um, and according to CMS, it starts at the time the beneficiary begins to receive hospital services. And it includes that time that the beneficiary has been receiving any type of outpatient services in the hospital, such as op services or treatments in the emergency department. Um, CMS does not count, however, wait times before the initiation of care, such as if you're in the ER being triaged. Um, and of course, it doesn't um, count time that's there for the convenience of uh, the patient or the family, you're, you're simply, um, you know, waiting uh, to be transferred to a different hospital. That, that wait time does not count. However, there is a, an exception. If a patient's waiting for the availability of a SNF bed, uh, the physician, and there's one not available, uh, the physician may certify that the patient needs to be in continued inpatient admission uh, in accordance with the regulatory provisions. So this is a, essentially an old rule uh, that CMS uh, is acknowledged as an ex sort of an exception to the two midnight rule. Um, if a patient is transferred, CMS has a policy on that as well. You count pre-transfer time and care provided to the beneficiary at the initial hospital towards the two midnight benchmark. Um, CMS has a policy on canceled surgical procedures as well. Uh, if it's just, if, excuse me, if a physician is, um, believes that the patient needs the procedure, uh, admits the patient, but then, then the, the procedure is canceled, so long as the physician's expectation at the time they made the admission decision is that the patient needed a two midnight stay, then that's a payable claim. Um, delays in care, however, um, uh, will not be counted as part of the benchmark according to CMS, uh, and contractors will be instructed to exclude, you know, extensive delays in providing medical necessity, excuse me, medically necessary services. So if a patient raises the question what happens in a, in a smaller hospital, for example, if a patient is waiting around um, uh, over the weekend for a diagnostic test, which is not an infrequent occurrence. Um, so in terms of practical tips, um, one thing that I like to tell clients is that, um, as you can see, you can, uh, the, the summation of the two midnight rule is, Clearly, if there's a medically necessary, if a stay is, is crossed to midnight after the inpatient order is dropped, that's a, a, a billable part of a claim and one should be expected to be paid for that because there's a presumption of medical necessity. But there are going to be a host of claims that are less than two midnights after the inpatient order is written, which are still payable uh, and which the bill can't, you know, part A claim can be submitted. Um, but there has to be in the medical record you know, first of all, that expectation that the physician uh, reasonably expected that the patient was going to need services across two midnights, and when that decision is made to drop the claim or to, to bill under Part A, care should be taken to make sure that uh, for that particular claim, uh, there is, you know, under these these clock counting and time counting rules, that there, a case could be made that the patient did receive services uh, prior to their 
or inpatient admission, which can be counted to, towards a two midnight benchmark. So um, one sort of good, you know, practical tip here is to make sure that the medical record does not, you know, create gaps of time, so to speak. Uh, make sure that there's no time waiting for medical care that's being counted towards a two midnight benchmark uh, or intentional delays in care because medical reviewers will look at these gaps in time and they will interpret those. You know, first of all, they will exclude them from the two midnight benchmark and they will interpret them as, you know, basically wait times. Uh, so the tip and takeaway is avoiding gaps in time uh, in the medical record and making sure that the record adequately documents um, when all services were delivered so you can make the case that um, under the time counting rules, uh, you have provided hospital services for a period of time, continuously for a period of time that's greater than two midnights. So there are two attending um, policies that went along with the two midnight rule. There was a physician written order requirement and a physician certification. Um, and these um, are, have been in a state of flux ever since CMS um, came out with the two midnight rule. Uh, the physician order requirement is essentially um, it raises from a, a condition of participation to a condition of Medicare payment that there must be a physician order for inpatient admissions entered into the medical record, supported by physician's admission and progress notes, and furnished at or before the time of admission in order for a Part A claim to be medically uh, p medically necessary and payable under Part A. Um, so what that essentially means is that in the past, um, there was ambiguity as to whether or not a written order was required for payment. Uh, and CMS has clarified that rule and says that, yes, a written order is required for payment. There's, a, there's some exceptions to that that I'm going to cover in a second. Um, but um, Basically, what this means is that, that from an audit perspective, if there's not a written order in the record um, and there is medical review done of that claim, you can expect that that claim will be denied on the basis that there was a missing uh, written order. Uh, and the medical review contractors will say, well, their hands are tied because it's now a condition of Medicare payment and it's not up to their discretion. Um, again, there is an exception to that that I'm going to cover in a second. Um, under the order requirement, um, CMS basically says that you know anyone can finish anyone who is authorized by the state to admit patients in, in, to hospitals, granted ho privileges by the hospital, and is knowledgeable about the patient's hospital course uh, can furnish this written order that's now required for payment. Um, there was some confusion uh, about what would be the case for medical residents, um, physician assistants, nurse practitioners, and other mid levels. Um, can they act as a uh, can they act for the admitting physician when ordering, uh, when uh, for purposes of this written order requirement? And CMS has essentially said that, listen, so long as that individual is authorized under state law to admit patients, um, permitted to do so under the policies and bylaws, in other words, granted privileges by the hospital, um, they can, and the attending countersigns the order, uh, then those they can essentially you know, make the, the determine the admission decision. That would mean that the attending is essentially by countersigning the order, they're adopting or authenticating that decision. Um, the question uh, really comes into uh, connection with medical residents uh, who are doctors, of course, uh, but may or may not have been given privileges. And CMS has, you know, kept a hardline policy on this that those individuals, uh, in order for that physician order requirement, uh, to be uh, c complied with, that medical resident uh, must be authorized under state law and been given privileges at the hospital for that order with only their signature uh, to comply with, or that only their signature to be on the order uh, to be compliant with the written order requirement. If they haven't been given privileges, CMS's position is that the, um, that the resident must have that order countersigned or authenticated uh, by an attending physician. Um, CMS has basically said there's no specific language required in the order other than uh, you should uh, be very clear uh, and make sure that you're using the word inpatient, right, such as admit to inpatient um, or admit to inpatient care. Otherwise, um, any ambiguity uh, may be uh, construed against uh, the hospital. 
So let's talk about the, the one exception to uh, the written order requirement that CMS has announced. Um, <clears throat> that is, you know, there may be circumstances in which uh, the written order just m somehow for whatever reason is defective. Uh, either it was, it's missing from the record, uh, it was not signed before discharge, which is a requirement uh, under the certification rules, uh, or it's illegible in some sort of way. Um, it, even though the written order is a condition of Medicare payment, can a hospital bill and expect to receive payment for defective orders? Um, and CMS has said in extremely rare circumstances, the order to admit may be missing or defective, yet the intent to admit the patient may be very clearly derived from the medical record. So in other words, if, it's, if we're looking at a situation where the patient uh, very clearly needs to be admitted as an inpatient, uh, and in fact, it would have been inappropriate not to treat the person as an inpatient. If there's a defective order, CMS has directed its Medicare contractors to essentially um, to waive the written order requirement or at least uh, construe that it has been satisfied because there's uh, overwhelming evidence in the medical record that the, the physician intended to admit the inpatient. So that is something that um, all hospitals should consider uh, when they're when they're facing uh, illegible or missing or defective orders. Um, before I talk about the physician certification, uh, Valerie, would it be, uh, can I ask you to read the next polling question? Sure. So our next polling question is, which practitioners at your facility have privileges to admit patients as inpatients? Select one, physicians only, physicians and medical residents, physicians and mid-level allied health per personnel, all of the above, or does not apply. Well, it looks like from the results that um, and this, uh, again, is, is fairly typical. Um, many of, and this could actually reflect scope of practice laws in, in the area in which we're talking about that perhaps um, mid-levels are not given uh, permission uh, under state law to admit patients. I, I'm not familiar with those. But um, most, of, most of the attendees who, who this applied to said that uh, only if physicians are given um, uh, privileges uh, to admit patients. Um, I'm, I'm going to roll that response sort of into talking about the physician certification, and I'm going to actually condense a lot of what we're going to say about the physician certification because um, there's really two things that, that we need to know about the physician certification. One uh, is that it's been per perhaps the most difficult thing for uh, hospitals to comply with under the two bin that rule in my experience with my clients, um, and that's because the certification um, really requires, excuse me, not sure exactly what happened there. That's because the certification requires um, that the uh, that the certification be um, signed or authenticated by a physician prior to discharge of the patient. And in it, when we're talking about sh stays of short duration, uh, that can be a very big challenge. Um, and there are many, many stories and many, many circumstances that I've heard of where hospitals have had to um, rejigger uh, their case management uh, processes or rejigger their electronic health admission, uh, excuse me, their elect electronic health records um, programs in order to uh, ensure that physicians who generally either uh, are passing along their orders verbally, expecting to come back uh, behind uh, at a different time and authenticate that written order, excuse me, authenticate uh, that order so it becomes a written order, that those uh, processes have needed to be uh, changed in order to uh, make sure that physicians are complying with the certification requirement. Um, and that, uh, in, in connection with who is permitted to uh, be who's permitted to have privileges at hospital, that could become an issue. So, for example, um, some hospitals I know, ha even though uh, emergency department physicians typically do not have admission 
uh, privileges prior to the two midnight rule to ensure that there has been a um, signature prior to discharge, they have given authority of the admission, uh, excuse me, of the emergency department physicians uh, to issue inpatient, uh, written inpatient orders of admission. Uh, same for allied health personnel. Um, some, in, some hospitals have moved to authorize them to make that so that they're making sure that somebody can sign that certification prior to discharge. The certification rules um, were, are, are fairly complex. Uh, in that there, are, even though there's no set form uh, for a, a, an order, excuse me, a certification, CMS did say that the any certification has to include these elements, um, and these elements include, you know, why the patient is being admitted for services, how long it's, the patient is expected to stay at the hospital, uh, and that there should be uh, some indication in the medical record that the stay is reasonable and necessary and that it's in accordance with the two midnight benchmark. In other words, that the patient um, is expected to need hospital services for, two, that for a period of time that crosses two midnight. Um, what is important uh, to, from today's perspective about the certification is that in the 2015 proposed outpatient rule, CMS has, um, uh, has proposed to eliminate the certification requirement. Um, for stays, um, acceptance stays that are longer than 20 days for long cases. Um, in other words, a physician certification would not be required for other inpatient stays. And this change, according to CMS, is being proposed because they recognize that the certification requirement has brought uh, about uh, significant administrative requirements and changes in, in on hospitals. So if adopted, that would mean that it would apply to admissions after the effective date of the 2015 rule, which is October 1st, 2014. Um, so there would be this period of time of only October 1st, 2013 to October 1st, 2014, in which that certification requirement would be uh, required. And as we're going to talk about in a second, there's been sort of a, um, a, a slowdown or of implementation of the two midnight rule. So uh, this is a fairly significant development from CMS. Um, and it raises the question as to uh, well, if the physician certification requirement has been eliminated, will orders still be required? Um, and when must they be authenticated? Will they still need to be authenticated prior to discharge in order to be paid under, under the Medicare program? Because that has been the most significant difficulty uh, for hospitals in, in meeting uh, and complying with that rule. So let's talk uh, for a moment um, about the what some folks have called the two midnight or the partial enforcement delay. Um, when CMS rolled out the two midnight rule um, in August and September of 2013, um, as I said and alluded to at the beginning, it was met with a lot of protest um, because it was somewhat unexpected. And the, the, these protests have essentially uh, led CMS to delay what it called post payment status review for claims for dates of admission after October 1st, 2013, i.e. the point in time in which the two midnight rule began to apply. Um, it did that for a few months, and, and what it said was, oh, well, you know, we are going to only review this on a prepayment basis. Uh, we're going to do so through these limited probe and ed educate audits by Medicare administrative contractors. Uh, we're not going to allow the RACs to review patient status, and when they say patient status, they mean whether or not the two midnight rule plus the written order and certification requirements have been met. Um, these delays and uh, this, this sort of delay or this slow rollout of the two midnight rule initially was supposed to last for only a few months. CMS um, expanded that um, uh, up until March uh, 31st of 2014 at one point in time, and then they continued to expand it, and then essentially um, Congress get, got in on the act. In, in the Protecting Access to Medicare Act of 2014, um, which was enacted on April 1st, the Congress essentially said that they are instructing CMS to continue the medical review activities under the Probe and Educate uh, in, uh, program, and they're going to prohibit CMS and the contractors and its contractors from conducting patient status reviews, which are reviews for claims with dates of service from October 1st, 2013 through all the way through March 31st, 2015. So it effectively extends that partial enforcement delay that was identified by CMS for an additional um, 
six months. So what is the current status of the two minute rule is, it still is a law, it still is in fact um, a rule that must be complied with, um, and uh, even though recovery audit contractors cannot look back at these claims ever according to CMS, um, that doesn't mean that the delay is sort of a free enforcement pass. Um, again, because it is still the rule, um, contractors can review as, as dictated by CMS or any other government authority. And what that means uh, when I read that is whether uh, HHS OIG uh, or the Department of Justice, for example, if they thought that there was abuse or gaming of the two midnight rule, um, they might direct CMS or contractors to conduct medical reviews. So, you know, I, I often you know, talk about the four minutes of the enforcement delay just to get across the idea that um, it is not the case that the two midnight rule is not in effect. It in fact is in effect, um, but it's only being it, it, um, it's only being enforced by CMS in these very limited probe and educate audits at this point in time. And that will last apparently until March 31st of 2015. Um, the Probe and Educate program is something, um, of course, which you know, kind of uh, alluded to. Um, and you know, the from my perspective, um, I think that the Probe and Educate program is still going on, but I'll spend a, a minute or two just discussing it. Um, essentially. Again, CMS announced the probe and educate at the same time that they kind of announced the partial enforcement delay of the two midnight rule. And under this, uh, you know, Medicare administrative contractors were to pool samples of claims uh, to determine whether or not they were complying with the two midnight rule, uh, the two midnight benchmark, the written uh, physician order, and the written certification requirement. And uh, there was sort of a program put in place. Um, that if you, you know, did fairly well, um, you would uh, essentially uh, be never hear, you know, you might never hear from the MAC again if, you're, uh, uh, if your audit results um, uh, were such that they were under a certain error rate, uh, then you would essentially be declared that you're complying with the rule. If your audit results uh, were such that you were sort of a, in the mid-range, then uh, what would happen is that uh, CMS would, you know, provide you instructions on, you know, excuse me, the contractor would provide you instructions on, on you know, as to why they would uh, so and so educate you as to why you're not complying with the rule, and then there may be a re-audit of certain claims. And then if you were really having difficulty and you were substantially not in compliance, um, they would uh, provide you more education, and they would increase with a higher number of audits. Uh, in the subsequent re-audit. So by this point in time, according to CMS, all, um, all hospitals are supposed to have uh, been uh, subject to the Probe and Educate audits and also advised of the results of the Probe and Educate audits. And so um, I always like to sort of pull the audit to find out what their experience has been so, thus far with the Probe and Educate audience. So Valerie, can I ask you to read the third polling question? Yes. Has your hospital received its MAC probe and educate results? If so, what were the findings? We have not yet received our results. Substantial compliance, only 0 to 1 found not compliant. Moderate compliance, 2 to 5. Substantial non-compliance, more than 5. And don't know because I can't understand the probe educate results. Well, the results are fairly um, consistent with what I have heard. Um, you know, almost half of the respondents are saying that they have not yet received the results. Uh, and there's a substantial number who have also said that um, even though uh, they've received results, they don't know what they are because they, they're difficult to understand. And, you know, this slide, slide 39, really kind of explains you know, some of what my clients' experience have been with Probe and Educate audience. Uh, uh, the, the probe and educate program. The results are, are really varying. Sometimes they, you know, whether or not, you know, they believe that the contractors are getting their um, probe and educate, excuse me, getting their compliance with the two minute rule correct uh, is questionable. Um, 
Sometimes there's little explanation um, that's provided in the follow-up explanatory letter that's promised. Often you have boilerplate language uh, that doesn't really provide any sort of explanation about why the benchmark's not been met in the opinion of the reviewer. And, you know, sometimes the educational phone calls, they get the same sort of response. Now, that is not to say that this is, you know, 100% uniform reaction. I've had other clients who say that the results are fairly easy to understand and they have found them useful. But I think what this really represents is that as we are learning how to implement the two midnight rule, well, so is CMS and so are CMS's contractors. Uh, so there's just, this is just evidence that this area is very confusing. Whether or not one is still complying with it is still subject to, you know, interpretation of guidance, interpretation of regulation, uh, and we're going to continue to have confusion about this as we move forward. Um, in the interest of time, um, I, I do want to um, talk about a uh, few other things about, you know, what this was labeled as a Tubman 9 update. One thing that the audience should recognize is that there currently is litigation on the two midnight rule out there, um, and it really falls into two buckets. One bucket is there actually has been lawsuit um, that is brought by the affordable, excuse me, AHA that challenges whether or not CMS has the authority to enact the two midnight rule itself, and that that lawsuit is um, still active, um, and there's been no results in it yet. Uh, there also has been, you know, lawsuits that have been challenged. Uh, along with the two midnight rules, CMS also reduced the inpatient uh, hospital payment rates by 0.2% to offset what they predicted would be a shift in the utilization between inpatient and outpatient settings. In other words, they predicted that as they implemented this two midnight rule, that there would be a net change of 400, excuse me, 40,000 cases across the country that would become higher inpatient accounts, would, would become inpatient encounters. And so their auditors went back and tabulated up the financial impact of that and decided that it would cost $220 million as an increase to um, aggregate Medicare expenditures. So they decided to reduce uh, the inpatient uh, standardized rate by 0.2% to compensate for that. That rate reduction has been challenged um, by a number of hospitals. Uh, yours uh, truly is, uh, represents uh, a number of them in the Athens Regional Medical uh, Center case. Um, and I may even have a client or two in the audience, I'm not certain of that. Uh, but the, the, the basic allegation is that uh, CMS messed this up, that the data actually does not support uh, a 0.2% rate cut and that uh, this, this idea that there would be an increase in inpatient encounters when CMS has made the coverage standard more difficult to get uh, Medicare inpatient payment is counterintuitive and that in fact the data shows that there would be a decrease uh, in aggregate Medicare expenditures. So if anything, CMS should be increasing the inpatient rate to compensate. Um, and then I would like to also talk about, uh, spend the last remaining minute here talking about the Office of Medicare Hearings and Appeals pilot project that I mentioned at the beginning of the call. Um, as I said before, the Office of Medicare Hearings and Appeals um, has essentially stayed um, the uh, assignment to a Medicare uh, administrative law judges of all uh, appeals other than appeals brought by beneficiaries. And the reasoning for that, according to OMHA, uh, which is the acronym for Office of Medicare Hearings and Appeals, um, is that there are so many cases that are clogging the system that they uh, need years and years to work through this backlog before they can assign further cases. Now, there is a task force um, within office, excuse me, within the Department of Health and Human Services that is working on concepts and ideas to help reduce the backlog. And um, OMHA recently announced two pilot projects that are designed to help reduce this backlog, the Statistical Sampling Initiative and the Settlement Conference Facilitation Pilot. Under the SSI, um, basically, uh, Omaha would use sampling um, experts to identify units that are up on adjudication and the results of, um, they would pull a sample, uh, they would then adjudicate uh, that sample, let's say it's short of patient claims, and then the results of that, that sample, let's say it's a sample of 10, would be applied to the entire universe of, you know, 250 or more claims. Um, this is, uh, you know, there's limited eligibility for this, as most pilot projects are. The appeals, for example, have to be filed between April 1st of 2013 and June 30th of 2013, so it's a narrow window. Um, you have to have a minimum of 250 claims, and um, the uh, what what 
most providers will face here is a likely reassignment of an AL to a different ALJ that they have uh, for the claims that they have up on a hearing. In addition to that is a settlement conference pilot, which uh, basically this is a voluntary um, alternative dispute or mediation project where uh, providers can sit uh, in a room uh, around a table with an Omaha mediator uh, with CMS or the CMS contractor to see if they can just essentially settle the claims on appeal. Um, this would have resulted in a settlement agreement <clears throat> and, you know, with a, obviously with some sort of compromise on the dollar amount of the appeal. Uh, and if uh, there was a signed settlement agreement, then the, you know, you would get your money and the appeal would be dismissed. Again, this is of limited eligibility because, um, first of all, CMS is only a, um, going to apply this to claims for Medicare Part B instead of claims for Medicare Part A. Um, but in addition to this, as this slide indicates, there are uh, a number of other um, uh, limitations, such as <clears throat> you must have filed your request for an ALJ in 2013, and it must not currently be assigned to an ALJ. So, uh, Valerie, let me ask you to read the final polling question. Sure. Do you think your hospital or client will take advantage of the OMHA pilot projects? No, because they do, do not apply to any of our claims. No, because we don't want to take a chance on unknown ALJ. Yes, we are still evaluating our options, or NA does not apply. Well, it seems as though a significant number of um, uh, people in the audience are, are with um, are with uh, organizations that are still trying to consider whether or not to um, utilize these uh, uh, these pilot projects. And I will say this about them: <clears throat> um, I think, and I've had clients that I deal with where who are continuing to discuss the the legal implications of of doing some of these pilot projects. They're 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 it's not altogether. Uh, clear from reading um, the guidance that is put out by Office of Medicare Hearings Appeals exactly how they apply or exactly what some of the implications of them are. But they are tempting, uh, particularly if you're facing a large volume of dollars um, and you've done fairly well, uh, as most hospitals have been doing, in appealing their denials of, of inpatient Part A stays. Uh, the idea that you can basically move to the front of the line uh, and have a sample of your claims um, heard uh, and have that extrapolated uh, and, you know, basically get your money sooner based upon the results of that is a fairly tempting thing. There are a few pitfalls that, that people should uh, watch out for, and, and we're in the process of advising some folks about what those pitfalls are. Uh, the mediation project, in my view, is something which is tempting as well, <clears throat> and I would like to see CMS um, in Omaha consider expanding that to the Part A realm instead of just the Part B realm. Valerie, I, I know that we're um, at one o'clock, well, do you see at least it's one o'clock, um, and we're at the end of the um, hour. Um, I'm happy to, you know, answer questions for the next few minutes if people have questions or I'm not sure, you know, how to proceed if we're going over a little bit. Okay. Um, we, we can um, take time. If, if folks need to drop off, that's fine. Um, at, at this time, I don't see any questions that have been posted, at least um, uh, in my queue here, so um, uh, Brad, I may need some assistance if we want to open for folks just to um, ask their questions. Hey, Valerie. Yeah, so if anyone's got any questions, the, the quick and easy way is to go ahead and enter in that questions box. Um, if, if you're on the phone or you know you're set up to where your uh, computer audio works, if you want to hit that raise hand button, um, I can unmute you and, um, you know, have a little bit more interactivity and, um, you know, you can ask your questions uh, directly. Brad, I'm, I'm not seeing any of those at, yeah, at this point in time. Neither am I. I mean, I think I think Mark did a great okay. job of laying out all of the options, so I'm kind of not surprised there aren't uh, aren't a lot of questions today. Okay. 
Well, I'm happy if people want to send me an email. Uh, my email is on the slide. If they um, you know, have a question or two about the presentation, or if I can embellish on anything that I had to cover, you know, quickly uh, for the presentation, I'm, I'm happy to to do any follow up with anybody who's in the audience. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate it very much. Sure. All right. I believe this ends our session today. Thank you. Thank you.